why Kolam Yoga um, is different from normal, what we know generally as Kolam, is because I have explored and researched in depth the relationships of the Kolam in relationship to all the other disciplines that are um, actually taking part in the Kolam practice. So there has been a time where humans were doing the Kolam as a pictorial language. They were practicing it as a pictorial language where they were um, registering all the knowledge, the musical knowledge, the dance knowledge, the agricultural knowledge, the astrological knowledge, the mathematical knowledge. All knowledge was um, captured and uh, registered and um, held in the Kolam as a two-dimensional field of drawing. So it was not disconnected from all the other disciplines in life. And it was a, the first syllabus, I would, I would even say, I dare to say, because nobody really dares to say this in Tamil Nadu, but I think that this is the original Tamil language. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, uh, the scripture came, and then afterwards, of course, the whole, through the whole colonization and all, everything changed. The whole educational system actually changed. So um, women and men, not only women, but a majority of the women, in a time where it was still very matriarchal, they were holding the knowledge of the community through the practice of Kolam. But they were not only knowledgeable in Kolam, they were knowledgeable in music, in dance, in theater, in astrology, in mathematics, in agriculture. They had a huge repertory of knowledge and they were practicing this and they were educating the community in this. So they were also uh, channeling certain types of columns to certain types of professions in the community. So we have three major types of columns, and I will show them in progression a little bit, how uh, I have come to putting them together in a syllabus, because I'm trying to revive a syllabus that makes sense in today's uh, thinking in today's world, in today's um, contemporary context. And it's a huge, huge work. I've been at it for more than 20 years, and uh, I'm like at times drowning, <laughs> literally drowning in the complexity and in the magnitude of it and in the challenge that it uh, is to, to practice it, to execute it. Um, and I understand very deeply in through all the experiences that it gives me that it is a language. It is a pure language that is even disconnected from the culture as Tamil culture that we know now. It's actually even more profound than that. Mm -hmm. But thanks to Tamil culture, it has survived all these hundreds, thousands, maybe even years. And this is because I think there has been a very intelligent um, thinking that knew how to project into the future this language to safeguard it from becoming completely oblivious. They channeled the language uh, into making it a, um, a kind of cultural obligatory task. So it was aligned to religion and aligned to culture where they then uh, said, you. Um, farmer community, you need to do these type of columns, and uh, they taught them when to do it, like if the moon and the sun and the conjunction is like this, and it's equinox and it's solstice, and you know all these alignments, then there's this kind of um, this plant and this kind of fruit and this kind of root, and you know, so like that. So the whole column was like, completely envisioned to support that farmer culture in their ways, in their ways of recall, in their ways of um, working together with nature. And it was so beautiful. So uh, the women, they took it upon themselves to, um, to teach this also to their offspring. So 
there are very few, but there are still, luckily there are still, thank you to those that are still there, um, that are teaching their offspring a kolam like a language. They will make a kolam and they will say, this is this pumpkin flower. And when I make a cow dung patty and I put it in the center of the kolam, then I give it the auspicious designation that I'm honoring the sun because now the sun is very far away, but the pumpkin flower opens its heart and mimics the light of the sun and is completely there. So there the sun is and I bring it the sun to the center of this beautiful design honoring this pumpkin flower who then one day will become a pumpkin and this pumpkin then can nurture us. So you know there's this whole cycle that is then portrayed in the kolam and the woman is teaching her offspring this. But it doesn't stop there because there's a weaver community, there's a merchant community, there is also a scholar community, and there is also mathematicians and teachers and commerce people. And um, so all these different types of columns, they found different ways of being preserved in their different communities. So there are four major communities that we know of in India and they are the Shudras and the Vaishyas and the Kshatriyas and the Brahmins. And actually each of us have these four components in our body. We all are born like a Shudra. We all come with the limbs. So we all actually should be able to understand those type of columns that are designated to the Shudras. And then we are all also vicious because we go to school and we learn a craft and we learn how to how to um, domesticate, <laughs> you know, life and how to harness uh, being in um, exchange with other human beings. And we also are sometimes kshatriyas where we have to go and stand in our authority and be vigilant and also have foresight for. Um, events coming, some of us even become politicians and um, or big boss of a big company, <laughs> you know. So, and we have to fight for the good of um, the company and for the good of uh, humanity or the community or the nation or whatever. And some of us are scholars, have deep insight in wanting to learn and wanting to connect um, to a different realm of perception. So there are all these four stages and in the beauty of the Indian tradition is that actually we traverse all these four stages. We actually go through these stages in life. We are born Shudra, yeah, and as a child we, we play, we learn skills through our hands and legs and fingers, and then we learn how to how to channel them and how to learn to to harness the energies and sit and become more grounded in, you know, relating to others. And then we learn how to be, uh, you know, manning up and holding a household or grihasta or, or whatever. And then later in life, when we've done all those tasks, when we have grandchildren, we are no longer <laughs> needed to, to be that grihasta. We can actually go into that spiritual seeking and then you find a beautiful dancer like we witnessed where she now has loosened herself from that teaching community where she, you know, and then becomes now her time is there to choreograph and, and to manifest her spiritual seeking in um, Abhipsa, her performance. So, you know, so all this is so beautiful and it, this can still be very active if we are conscious of it. And the Kolam has hundreds and thousands of tools to learn to understand all these different layers of our being, our being in this world, in relationship to the community, in relationship to nature, in relationship to the forces, because we are all subjected to five very important forces, which is the fire, the thinking air, the thinking mind, the fires, the willpower in the thumb, connecting us also to heart energy. And then we've got the thinking mind that is, you know, I have an idea, it connects us to the collective consciousness. You know, we are 
we are here. <laughs> I'm asked to be louder. We are here to, to connect us to, to thought processes. But sometimes thoughts are not only our own thoughts. Sometimes a thought comes to us in a dream, or we have a vision, or we have something that we are catching. And then we realize, oh, somewhere else it's also been caught. You know, so this is this beautiful thinking mind. It's also the finger of the guru. It's also with which we point and the index. We, we have an idea. We know something. And then we've got the middle finger, the longest finger of all those five, which is the ether that connects us to sushumna energy. And actually, these three fingers, so the fire, the willpower, the thinking mind, the images with which you trap the image that you want to reproduce and co-create, and then that beautiful pranic energy with which you need to channel this. These three fingers are very active in creating columns. Sometimes one single line, so you're harnessing that. So when you're harnessing, when you're doing this abhaya mudras, and then what are you doing? Actually, you are harnessing and quietening the mind, stilling it and bringing focus to inside in the heart with the eyes looking into the heart or here somewhere in that region of the higher plane of consciousness where you, where you feel that you're connected to your bigger self or, you, or the collective self or you're, you're picking up something from the earth or you're making this beautiful column line. And there is also a rule in column practice where you want to do this movement of giving. So we can all try this, where you, where you take your left hand and you take the thumb and the pointing finger and you, and you gather some energy and then all the fingers and then the pointing finger and thumb let go and you're giving. So this energy of giving and this giving can come from very low under the navel and rise to the heart and give. This giving can also come from all the way your third eye plexus and give. This giving can be also giving to others, not only to the earth. It can be also giving to something that we do not see, but is there in our presence because we acknowledge it. So this giving, this act of giving is very important in column practice. Lines are always drawn. You start close to your body, and you move away. You're always in the act of giving. Sometimes you're obliged because of movement incapacity to pull the line towards you. So also there is a tradition and there's a language in each line how it moves. So if it moves from your body and away, it is a movement of fire. It is a movement of aspiration, a rising energy. If it's drawn and pulled towards you, it's a descending line. It's a line of anchoring yourself and coming to earth. If it's a line that's going horizontally, it's a line of water where you can start to also wave. Yeah, so you can rise, inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale. And that's why it's so beautiful because if you study Indian dance, you know how all these movements are connected to your breath. And it's not, only, it's not only here the movement, the movement comes with the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, from the whole chest, from how you're standing, where you're standing in your space, how you're anchored, where's your vertical axis, where's your horizontal plane. And then we've got these beautiful diagonal lines and these diagonal lines, they are creating the directional forces of the winds. So they connect us to the thinking world. So you've got fire, rising, rising, earth, water, and wind, yeah? And we know this because this has been all registered in dance, in tantric practice, in yantras that have been, you know, so like that. And when you start to make columns and you start to make them in that relationship, you start to deeply understand how this is every time reactivated. When you draw a line, you reactivate this 
connection of yourself connecting to that energy, you are co-creating that energy, you are calling upon those forces, you are calling upon the fire, you are calling upon the earth, you are calling upon the water, you are calling upon the winds. And when they cross, when you have the fire and the earth, and then the waters, when they cross, you get this very strong crossing energy. And always where there's the cross, there's that moment where the two lines meet and there's that friction moment where either like this or like that, they cross and they create this beautiful plus cross. This plus cross is the most ancient symbol of the sun. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of moments where we are crossing like that in every each column. It comes again and again. So it's always this moment of in that crossing, that's where you are, in the now moment. You are here in this moment of where your lines have crossed and there, in that cross. It's also very daring. It's a very daring energy. Some people find it difficult to cross, therefore have a hard time crossing. Then we understand that these kind of practices become very therapeutic because it is helpful for them to practice it again and again so that they can learn how to cross and how to dissolve the anxiety, the confrontation. The moment of friction becomes then a moment of, of jubilation, of celebration, of because your kolam is always a moment of channeling, the energy, your intention, and even sometimes if you're just completely blank and you're just copying a column, it will have its working. It will have its working in you. It will gather you. It will concentrate you. It will silence something inside of you in which you then become a receptor, but also a sieve, a sieve in which you are learning how to protect, how you are because when many lines cross, they kind of create a beautiful net, like a netting. And we see this in the beautiful siku columns where you have like a netting. And this netting is like a, like a gauze that you could put, you know, to protect healing process, uh, to prevent malignant forces from entering. And whatever enters into that space, knows how to enter because it has consciousness. When it has no consciousness, it is repelled. It is not able to decipher the network. It's not able to decipher the code because columns are all based on codes. And sometimes the codes are just linear, like in Padi Kolam. Padi Kolams are the columns that are made up of several lines, several steps, several resonance bodies. Like when we chant Om, we say Om one time. Om. Om. But what if we said Om many times? So we take a deep breath in. repeated vibrational field starts to resonate. So this is the body where there's a resonance body happening, where there's a frequency that is repeated, yeah? Where it's going from small, it's resonating out, it's growing. And actually we all are like that. Mm -hmm. That's how we grow from a child. We grow, we resonate because we repeat movements. We are very ritualistic in all our movements. We have habits that are coming again and again and again. And some define us stronger than others. And some are very positive and really help you to grow. And some we need to learn to shed, <laughs> you know. And so Kolam practice also helps us in defining what resonance body helps us to grow and what is it that we need to shed. Why? Because the resonance is always taking place in a bilateral symmetry in a fourfold symmetry. So bilateral meaning we have two eyes, two corners of the mouth, two earlobes, 
two shoulders, two hands, two legs. So we have this symmetry that we are all the time unfolding in our movements. And we know that if we are very strongly only sweeping for hours, we are sweeping only with the right side, then obviously the right side is going to start becoming more developed muscularly, but also more tight and maybe something is going to start compensating on the left side. So then we are actually off balance. So when we make a column, immediately this will show. Because your right side, the whole peripheral perception of your right side is going to be more developed than your left side. So you're going to have to learn because the visual feedback of the column is going to tell you, hang on, your left side is not, the proportions are not as proportionate, as symmetric as the other side. So the column will give you feedback and will tell you, you need to do a little bit more this side, a little bit more that side, <laughs> you know? So the column is teaching you how to balance, how to create harmony, how to become quiet, how to channel your energy, how to gather yourself from a center point and then distribute your energy exteriorly in all directions of space. So this, all our directions of space is so beautiful. It's again this crossing, you know, and also this X cross. This is so powerful, this X cross, because this X cross is like, it can be very soft. It can be like, you know, like a protection, like a protection of light. And even in ballet language, it's, it means love, you know. <laughs> it can be very strong. It can be, no, I don't want this. It can be the X on a treasure map. It can be the X to demarcate uh, a certain spot on a map. This is my home. You know, where the X is, go there, <laughs> you know. So this X is so powerful. And it, again, is the symbol for the sun. So we've got the plus and the X, they are both symbols for the sun, the most ancient symbols for the sun. And all columns have the X and the plus cross coming in one or the other way, either through the way it's weaving its lines or through the way it's aligning itself. So we've got the four major cardinal directions of space. We've got north, and that's the board which we do not want to face when making a column. But there is an exception. When we make columns of snakes, we face the north because that's the abode of the snakes. That's where Kubera houses. That's when we venerate the treasures of the earth, the guardian keepers of the earth. It's not for nothing that in Sanskrit lang language we call the snake, we call it also the Sarpa Reka. So there's this beautiful, we have got the line Reka, Reka is amidst us, mm -hmm. and her, her name is also standing for line. So this line, what is this line? It's birth out of a dot, and it starts to move out away from that dot, from that seeding, from that point. And it can move upward like a fire, it can move downward to the earth, it can move like water, it can move like wind, but it can also spiral around. It can start making forms and shapes when it closes upon itself again, then it creates a form. So then there is inside, a different space than what is happening outside and forms are birth. So we are actually made up out of a whole network of lines. Very, 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 we, they call it the quantum physics, you know, they have these, these very, very thin, thin network of lines and dots and, and when they, they, they become more and more dense, you find that the forms and the shapes become more and more dense. The densest maybe are the, the rocks like diamonds in the deep earth that also are the light bodies in the deep earth. And, you know, so like that, we've got this whole information of light, frequency, sound, vibration, resonance, uh, the energy of lines, and then these snakes. What do these snakes do? These snakes, they are the guardian keepers of the Kolam language. They are inhabiting also like our ephasigas, like our, you know, our food travels 
and then it goes to stomach and then all the intestines and then leaves the body. That's also like a big snake. Then we've got the Kundalini energy that is coiled energy in the Muladhara. And when it awakens, it comes and it's like a big hood, you know, and it, and it crowns you with, with consciousness. Yeah? So it awakens your consciousness to your higher self. So all this very deep symbolism is all present in the kolam. So the kolam is actually a language. It tells us many, many things. And when we learn kolam, we should actually be learning how to read the kolam, how to speak in kolam. This is the authentic way. This is the way it should have been always. But down the line, in all the, in all the taking away of authenticity, taking away of identity of those that have practiced the knowledge with the knowledge of the kolam and have been replacing their, their ways with others because of subjugation, because of indoctrination, because of brainwashing or, or gaslighting or whatever you want to call it, slowly, slowly it has kind of been scattered. And this is not only happening or only happened with the kolam. This happened with all the pictorial symbolical languages that we find all over the world from Navajo Indians to um, the Celtic drawings, to the Islamic art, to the Japanese knots, to the Chinese, to all these indigenous cultures have slowly and slowly started replacing their pictorial language for a more globalized language. Now, there's a whole resurgence of wanting to again understand this pictorial language because more and more people have understood that in this very ancient pictorial language lies the blueprint. It's like an architectural blueprint, an architectural drawing of how we are built, how our body is built, how our body functions, how our body stands in nature with the five elements. We have the earth finger, the ring finger, yeah? So fire, air, ether, earth, upon which we also put the wedding rings. Very Everywhere in the world we do that. And why? Because we say to each other, I promise in this earth body to take care of your earth body. I put there the finger, the ring finger. Then we've got the little finger, which is the water, Jalam. So that is connecting us to the backside, to the moon, to the kidneys. Yeah? We've got the thumb that's connecting us to the front side body. So we've got all these beautiful information in our hands. We have life in our hands. Our life is in our hands. We don't say that for nothing. Catch on to life. Hold on to life. Your life is in your hands. Do something with your hands, <laughs> you know? Fingers are also like antennas. They catch information. So in Chinese meridian medicine and all, there are now more and more, you see all, all over the network, <laughs> Instagram, Facebooking, more and more people that are showing exercises with the fingers to awaken the energies, to bring back balance and bring back harmony and bring back consciousness in this body, how it's relating to the world, how we are in this world. We are not disconnected from this world. We are this world. We are made up out of these five elements. The whole earth is made up out of these five elements and many, many variations and combinations of, because when we make different mudras, which are like locks, which are like locks that we find in Kolam also, Kolam is also full of locks, just like the mudras, where you hold something, where you gather something, where you say, I lock this energy for a little while. I cannot lock it for eternity. That's why my Kolam has to be ephemeral. That's why I practice it with powders so that I lock it for a little moment and I gather it for a little moment so that I can there say, I honor this energy. I say, I honor it in me. I honor it in you. I honor it in all of you. And then I let go of it again because it does not 
pertain to me. It is not me who owns it. I cannot own anything actually in this life. I'm just the passing through. I am passing through this vessel. And this vessel, I need to learn to understand how to, how to function in it. How to function it in it that is embedded in everything else around us. So the whole energy that is housed in the column as structures and lines and codes is actually a blueprint, like an architectural plan telling us how to live this body, this experience in relationship, in how it's embedded in life. And you learn about it more and more. And the thing is, if you are regular and you repeat certain things, the vibration of the column starts to open up your perception, your intuition, your other way of seeing, which is not being schooled in the ordinary schooling system that we know of today, the globalized schooling system, does not train you to be intuitive, does not train you to be perceptive, does not train you to be able to experience and feel resonance, does not actually tell you how to see, how to look, how to feel, how to think, how to be. It, it's just conditioning us to fulfill a small majority of population that is enslaving the whole lot. And this is very crude, <laughs> the way we say, but it comes factually down to that, that we are not allowed to self-empower ourselves in becoming intuitive again, becoming understanding of all these orifices that we have in the body and how they function. How do we absorb information? How do we regurgitate information? How do we spit out information? How do we regenerate things? We are actually here, and this is what the Kolam taught me, we are actually here to co-create this world. We are here with each image, with each vision, with each form and shape that we create, with each movement and gesture that we do, we are actually co-creating life. With each thought we have, with each spoken word, we are co-creating life. We are here co-creating life. Without all of you, I cannot do this presentation. Even the ones that are outside, in, but because of my field, you know, I, my thoughts, my visions, my intuition, I know who's all branching in, and Sasika so kind to doing that so I can reach out to many more. So we are co-creating. And there's nothing more beautiful. I have a question. How do you, you are very creative. So each time, each different space that you go, how do you, what inspires you to create so beautiful for you? So, first off, you have to learn uh, the kolam language so that you know that certain types of kolams have a certain working. And I have, I have laid out a whole carpet I would like to go through. And I have aligned them to the 12 qualities and they are, um, they are um, se segmented in 12 classes, actually, 12 sessions, where I teach the fundamental um, basic understanding of each type of the column. So there are three types of column, majority types of column. So there's the padi columns. In that, there are different types of padi columns. Then there are the kodupuli. They call them also pu kolam. Uh, I abstain from saying pu kolam because now many women do rangoli instead of the kodupuli. So I don't say pu kolam, but I know that in a few, like 30 years ago, they would say pu kolam instead of kodupuli kolam. And there also there are different types. And then there are the siku neli kambi kolams, which also have different types of columns. And they are clearly 
groups of columns, and there are very clear uh, vocabulary of column. There are very clear uh, saying certain things about the working of uh, life. And I've aligned them also to the 12 aspects um, of mother's symbol, which is very fascinating because it falls so beautifully into place. Mm -hmm. And um, this has been, um, this, this has just been downloaded um, because I think because of what the kolam wants me to do, because it's not me, it's the kolam that's doing it. The kolam is trying to tell me what to do. And, and sometimes I'm obstinate because I also have um, stubbornness, you know. Uh, I'm also conditioned by the normal education and I have to unlearn many things to understand the kolam. And it comes sometimes in a dream or sometimes when I'm making a kolam and I go faulty, I go, I go the wrong direction, then all of a sudden the kolam starts to talk to me and it starts to show what it wants to tell me. So I have many, many of those kind of experiences where the kolam is channeling the energy and telling me, now you do it like this, now you do it like that. And when I then go back to some of the communities of Kolam practitioners that I know distributed around the world, actually, not only in Tamil Nadu, but some are in Mumbai, in Delhi, in New York, in Australia, even in Holland. Um, and I reflect back to them and I give them, um, I tell them what experience I have or I share something with them. They tell me uh, that they have very similar experiences. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be that it is a moment in time that this, uh, as a language, wants to be, again, activated. And it's not only with the Kolam practice, because I've noticed this with um, Islamic art, uh, the Chokwe tribe uh, in Angola, their um, Lusona Sona drawings are also being activated again in brought into a broader context, in a globalized context. And people are now starting to branch to each other and starting to learn from each other, like, we find similarities in each other's cultures. We find similarities in meaning, in context. So there is this beautiful um, eight star and um, here. So we find this beautiful eight star and this eight star is being embroidered and being woven and they make um, uh, they make beautiful borders for wedding dresses in Balkan countries, Ukraine and, you know, those countries in Russia. And they use it in uh, the Navajo Indians, all actually Indians in America, they use it to make quilt blankets. And they, um, they have even big, beautiful scarves with this beautiful eight star and they do their dances with these scarves and they're like an eagle because this symbol stands for the sun and it stands for the sun in all these cultures not only here in Tamil Nadu but all over the world this symbol stands for the sun but it also stands for Venus and it also stands for Lakshmi so then we understand ah Lakshmi is the consort of Vishnu and Vishnu is the unblinking one. He carries the sun and he rides on Garuda, the bird of the sun, you know? And then we've got the bird of the sun, the eagle, that is in the Navajo Indians. And there they're dancing this big eagle dance with a scarf with the eight star on their back. So you think, but that's incredible. All this resonance is like a frequency that is manifolding all over the world. They have found, like that, I have found many, many of the symbols in the kolam that are resonating the same frequency, the same meaning, the same powerhouse. And all these people that are doing research, because once you start doing research, you start to resonate a certain thing. <laughs> you start to, it's like you become a magnetic energy that is that, is that energy, that is that energy, they are similar. They start to rotate like this, like two magnets. <laughs> You're attractive. That is attraction. Attractive, attraction. What does attraction and attractive do? They start to play together, like two peacocks. You know, they start to play together. And what do they start to do? They show their feathers to each other. 
and they want to out, 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 you know, they want to do competition, who is more beautiful. But then in the end, they fall in love with each other. So it's all a game of love. Kolam is full of love. It's language is full of love, 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 love. Love in different frequencies. Love the ordinary way, like parrots, the quill. You know, you make quills, and then and then you you do it for an engagement, or you do it in the beginning of spring. You have I just a month ago I saw many many quill columns. You know, in Kodupuli, all over. My friends all started making parrot columns. You know, so it was that time of the year again. They don't even realize one star said the second one, the second, third one, and then you see the parrots flying into your trees. It's that time of the year again. The mangoes are starting to come, the fruit are starting to come. They are attracting certain types of animals. So, you know, the columns appear that are aligned to that. So if we would be more conscious of that, if we would start to actually be more conscious of that, how beautiful our life would become so rich in aligning to all these different components that are, that are bringing balance, harmony, peace, and love. Because it's all about love. The kolam is one big love language. It really, truly is about ananda. It's about this unifying sense of Everyone is unique. You are a dot, you are a dot. And we have this incredible dance that is weaving us all together. And we are all in it together. We are not disconnected. So if you pull a little bit on the fabric this way, I will also feel that. I will also start to move a little bit this way. So I will do this. <laughs> and then you'll have to come this way, you know? Now we are looking for the game. Game? Yeah. Blessings. <laughs> She's blessed. <laughs> so it's, it's this kind of power. Are you ready to stand up with me? Yes. Because I can yes. keep talking. Eh? I, I have, uh, yes. I can keep, <laughs> and I will talk, but I think it's nice to sh uh, share a little bit. So, so I made a carpet and as you can see, I've painted the columns. Mm -hmm. That means that they are not as ephemeral any longer. So how does that work? When you paint a column, or when you emboss a column, or when you carve a column? Mm. Well, in the yantric practice, the understanding is that you need to do japas. And a japa is cleansing yourself and practicing a certain um, syllable or mantric energy, and with that comes a yantric shape, a form, and with that comes a certain practice. So you are you are you are channeling yourself to becoming aligned to a certain force. So if you paint columns and if you carve them, you are actually doing. Um, doing that kind of work, what actually a Brahmin would be doing when he's charging an amulet, a yantric symbol. But because we don't know how to do this anymore, because we don't do japas, we don't uh, charge our body mm -hmm. with a certain resonance field, we cannot charge the image of the kolam. So the kolam becomes nice, agreeable, it will do its working, it too is ephemeral. Even if it's painted, it's ephemeral. It will not last a hundred years. It will fade, it will, or it will burn, or it will, you know, deteriorate, or the insects will eat it, or it will, it will catch mold, or, you know, it will also lose its frequency and vibration. Now I've just painted it Sunday, and yesterday I spent on it painting it, so it's quite fresh and it's quite charged. And my intentions are quite charged in it. And you will see it's not perfectly balanced because I allow myself to let it come through me. I just let it come through me. What wants to come, comes. So when we go through the basic training of Kolam Yoga, we go through the first session and the first session is all about asking permission from the guardian keepers of the Kolam language, which are the snakes. 
So we learned to make a beautiful snake olam, and there are various That's snake olams. There are various snake olams that I teach, and the alignment too. Can you read it? Equanimity, threshold guardians, lesson one. Maheshwari. So we align it to Maheshwari. Why? Why the guardian keepers to equanimity? Equanimity. Immutable peace and calm. The supreme divine is founded on equality. The energy of Maheshwari is that of all perceiving, all seeing. We, when we want to call upon the snake, we need to learn to acknowledge that we are connected to it. So we need to learn to acknowledge how to perceive beyond the ordinary. We need to also learn to become quiet because when you encounter a snake and you're all like, <gasps> like this, the snake is definitely going to harm you. But if you're very, very quiet and you, and you resonate and you become in tune with the snake, the snake will actually greet you. Mm -hmm. The snake will look at you and will go. Yeah? It's not for nothing that we have so many beautiful stories in India about snakes. But there are stories in Africa, in China, in Japan, even in Holland, I found snake stories. Yeah, absolutely. In every culture, there are snake stories. So it's really fascinating. Look it up. So then we come to the second lesson. The second lesson is where I take you into learning how to make lines in resonance body mm -hmm. and how to attaching them and how to making the square. And the square stands symbol for soul, but also for earth. So we learn how to make our earth temple. And the temple that you make is an embodiment of your own physical temple. So it's honoring also your own physical temple. So for that, we are still in the realm of Maheshwari and we are calling upon the force of receptivity. Gopuram Kulam Temple. Pari Kolam, lesson two. Gopurams are like antennas. They reach up, some higher even. Yeah? So they go and they do this movement. Like even churches do that. All humanity wants to go in sky rises. Yeah, New York City. And, <laughs> you know, we want to go there. We have aspiration. We want to aspire for something. This also is the sound of go. Go, and then we come down lum into the earth. So this two big oppositional forces, the kulam, the water tank, also sound ku, go, go, go. In ancient Tamil, I looked it all up. I did so much research, I'm reading, reading. Go for scepter, the king, the tip of the mountain where Shiva resides. Go for the cow going into the horizon. You know, so all these, so you see, go, go, lam, lam, muladhara chakra, kulam. You know, so all these relationships. Things are not so fragmented like we think they are. They are actually deeply related and connected. So we have got the Kulam and the Gopuram and the cardinal directions of space. And this one is a typical Shaivite. They are very sober and very strong. Cardinal directions are present and lines are very clean. Yeah? And then this one is, you wanted, you wanted to read? The receptivity so, is conscious of the divine will and surrendered to it. Whole being is aware of the divine will and obeys it. So we can practice that through making these kind of columns. Yeah? And this is a lot of information. Just let it go in, let it go out, no problem. We come to Vaishnavite Parikolam and you see the difference between the Shaivite and the Vaishnavite, the Ayer and the Ayengar. Strength. Yeah, and there it is full of, full of these, these, and can you see all these crosses that I was speaking about? Here also we have crosses, but these crosses are now a lot more 
because they are emulating movement. They're emulating a never-ending growth. These type of columns can grow and grow and grow. You can make them bigger and bigger. Those also, but these are even more abundant. They have a lot of suri, a lot of curls, a lot of tendrils, like in plants. They have a lot of flowering energy. They have, this is very Vaishnavite. It's celebrating the abundance of the growth and the prosperity and the bounty and the wealth of life. And there's always this kind of concaved eight kind of energy. The eight star is also very prominent in it. And um, Lakshmi is also very prominent in it. A lot of adherence to uh, Lakshmi's energy. So there we are practicing peace because only you can grow only when you are Yes, because if you are tight and you cannot grow, you are stuck, you're stagnant, your your energy. So what does it say? It's so beautiful. We're still in Maheshwari's energy here. Still this wideness, all seeing, perception. In peace and silence, the eternal manifesto, let nothing trouble you and the eternal will manifest. The divine is supreme peace. Be with the divine and you will be in peace. You already covered. Yeah. The Raj Yes. Lesson three. Then we come to Padikolam's that can house Shaivite and Vaishnavite components. Here I've kept it quite sober. And you can see that it's all based on cross, the swastika, the sun disk. So we've got the swastika going right around, but we also have the suvastika going left around. And it's really commemorating the energy of the sun and it's weaving. So there also we've got the braid of Sita or the locks of Shiva and Brahma's knot. You know, so there's all these very powerful symbology there. And these type of columns, they are practiced really in temples, in um, puja rooms. They're actually, all these are not to be made on the street. Mm -hmm. They're not to be made at the threshold. They're to be made inside. They are like thrones. They are like um, acknowledging the divinities. And uh, even like, you know, that type of column is actually to be made um, on the wedding platform or it's not something that you actually walk across. Right. It's not supposed to be walked over. Yeah, we took the risk to do that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no. So here we, we enter here into Mahakali's energy with courage because it takes a lot of courage to go through the cross, to spin the wheels, to spin the disc. When you have right side around spinning and left side around spinning, what you're emulating is, you're emulating the north and the south pole, but you're also emulating the sphere, the energy that is, that is taking place. And we have then the Taurus ring, if anybody knows about these scientific discoveries where we have like a donut kind of shape and it starts to spin and there is a vacuum energy with the nothingness. And that is all symbolic in the swastika. And the swastika is the most ancient symbol in the world. You find it all over the planet, everywhere, carved, painted, mosaic, tiled, ceiling, floor, everywhere. <laughs> so courage is the total absence of fear in any form. When we trust in the divine grace, we get an unfailing courage. Mahakali, and this is form and shape, Kodapoli Kolam, lesson five. No, yeah. Is that one, two, three, maybe lesson four? I did something. Just okay. remembering more. No, no, something went wrong. <laughs> Uh, ah, it should have been aspiration. Or am I doing some anyway? There we go. There. 
my thinking mind. So we come to, shall we take this? Yeah, yeah for it, the aspiration. Of for the aspiration, world. yes. In the first one in Mahakali's sequence is aspiration. Now it's dying. Up. Yes. Yeah. The sun disk, swastika and suvastika, party column lesson four. Yes. So daily we must aspire to conquer all mistakes, all obscurities, all ignorance. We must aspire with all our being for the manifestation to come soon and complete. Yes. So, you see, even when I turn things around, things can still make sense because in everything we have all the layers. Yeah. Now I stretch them and I pull them separate from each other, but actually our whole fabric of life should be perceived as one. It's like, a, it's like an incredible clockwork all the wheels, everything, you know, they're all entangled with each other and they're all functioning together. They're not separate from each other. But we are not conditioned to seeing that. We're so conditioned to seeing things se separate and segregated. So it, it takes a lot of effort for us to first see everything and then to start learning to see the relationships intertwined. It's like in dance, you have all these separate components that you learn and then you learn to piece them together and you start to find new ways of how they can align to each other and how one movement can flow into the, art, the next and how that flow takes place and how that also, that putting the, is, is also a certain kind of energy. It's also a certain kind of force and working. And like that, it's with music, it's with architecture, it's with uh, singing, it's with uh, so many things of life, even cooking, <laughs> no? So then we come to, yes. This one, no? Yeah, now I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I did it really fast when I arrived. Yeah. So we come to the first uh, Kodupuli columns, and um, here you see the embodiment of fishes that are swimming also in swastika. Because if you look at the leftover space, even if they're swimming with their faces inward or they're swimming with their faces outward, this is the abstraction of the shape of a fish. You can see the shape of a swastika. Yeah? Can you see that? Mm. Yes. And you can see the eight star, and this is called, I called it the dog rose, but it's the ancient rose in, um, and it's very popular also here in our villages. We, we see them made many, many times in all kinds of configurations. And when we start to practice this, I call this the courage. Um, it's because we need to become courageous to acknowledge our connection to all forms and shapes. She, she had to leave? I think she's on the call. Ah, okay. So this is a this is, um, continuation of Mahakali. So courage is the... Courage is the total absence of fear in any form. When we trust in the divine grace, we get an unfailing courage. So there are many stories aligned to Matsya, the fish. And Matsya also is symbol for traversing 40 days of rain and darkness and rebirthing. And all that is also a requirement of courage. So it's a very Mahakali energy and force that is at play there. That's why I've chose to coin this. Um, and also I had, Personally, a lot of difficulty with the Kodupuli columns because I thought they were very simplistic. I thought, oh, there's nothing to it. It's just copying a snake. It's copying a cow. It's copying a, 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 a flower. It's copying a, a fish, an elephant, a peacock. Okay, it's child play, you know, nice. We color it a little bit. But then I understood something very deeply. When we learn to make these kind of columns, if we are capable of capturing 
the abstract form and shape of any living being, and we learn how to reproduce this, we learn how to place it outside of us, we not only acknowledge this force in our lives, but we also learn to understand that it's part of us. It also has curvatures, like my body. You see, it's like fish, you know? And, and I also have this roundness, and, and I can relate to this fish. Maybe I was once a fish, who knows, you know? So there's this deep, deep relatedness, and it's so important. And long before cameras and video recorders were there, we had to learn biology and all things that were in our natural world, we had to learn them by learning how to draw them. So in all schools all over the world, if you wanted to understand how to transmit information about a cow or about an elephant, you need to not only write, but you need to also know its shape and form. Yeah? So it's very interesting. You can look into it. There's something very fascinating about it in its psychology. Then we come to sincerity, and um, I've used the image of the peacock and the elephant. They are very popular, beautiful images. The four pillars of the world are the elephants, and the elephants are also two in Lakshmi, giving beautiful showering of bounty, energy, and the elephants when you draw an elephant with a child, like with the whole kindergarten group, they come and I drew an elephant column. Look, my back is also like an elephant. You know, I'm like an elephant. You can see that? And my legs, you know, and then my trunk. And I feel this elephant in my body, you know. It's incredibly powerful. And the children feel, oh, yeah. And then they draw the back and the sturdiness and the earth energy in the square. All of a sudden, they have a deep connection and relationship to elephants. If we keep nurturing this, there's an ancient saying, if you forget about a certain animal in the world, they will go extinct. But as long as we keep remembering them, as long as we keep bringing them in our inner eye and keep seeing their shape and form and function and their relatedness to us, we actually keep them alive on this planet. We are that powerful. We are that powerful. The peacock is a remembrance of sincerity because the peacock has this pride. It shows itself, you know, it likes to, it likes to show itself and, you know. <laughs> then what does it say? Remember not to get trapped in your own ego, in your own pride. Search for what is true in your life, what is sincere in your life. And what does Mahakali say to this? Sincerity is the gate to divinity, to be constantly the true flame that burns like an offering. Beautiful. The peacock too are held in swastika energy, and the elephants too are held in suvastika energy. Swastika right around, suvastika left around, they are going, yeah? Then we come, so these are all kodupuli columns. We still are in kodupuli columns. Then we come, this is nerpuli, where your lines are straight aligned to each other, and then we come to idikapuli, where the lines are forming a different kind of grid. These are very powerful, very magical, because they hold all the secret codes of life matter, the secret flowering of life, the flower of life, the egg of life, all geometry, all sacred symbolism is based on these Golam types. And what's even more exciting is when I go into this with my students, I teach them to draw them to the measure of their body. We even learn by lying down in our kolam and seeing the coccyx and the base of the spine, the proportions, how they fit in a kolam, how we make kolams that are aligned to the proportions of our body. And they are completely aligned and we become one with the kolam. It's a very beautiful experience. This we learn in intermediate and advanced kolam practice. Yeah, but in the basic training, I give you really a lot of tools in how to create your own, find your own kolams, 
play with them? How can they like be hives, be stacked and packed together? You know, because there's such an intelligence, there's so much fractal energy and tiling and tessellation, all these mathematical values that are playing there. And um, so we've got all these different symbols here. This is the flower of life. No, this is the egg of life. Then there's something that looks similar to the egg of life, but there's something missing because that is a lotus. Yeah. And this is a different kind of lotus because also here, this is a six star lotus. Then you've got the sacred cube with its six facets. All that then leads to games, all the different games that we have in all ancient cultures are also there to teach us certain things of value to, you know, so it's, it's all aligning there. So all these threads, too much to say. <laughs> so what did I give it? I gave it the initiation of goodness and we come to Mahalakshmi's energy because Mahalakshmi is all about balance and rhythm and co-creation and making sure that the creation keeps creating and that we are all part of this creation. A day spent without doing a good deed is a day without a soul. Good is all that helps the individual and the world towards their divine fullness. Lovely. And you see that in, in our villages here or surrounding us, Edian, Chavri, Alang, Kupam, uh, Kotakai, all these <laughs> villages, we see how this goodness is practiced again and again. They really try to do that also through their columns. The women are really in Margari Masam in December, January, they're really trying to practice their goodness in covering and giving and reaching out in, in celebrating and um, what better way to do it with beauty, with uh, beautifying space and, and acknowledging the beauty in each other. So we have kolam competitions and luckily in Mylapur kolam competition, we don't go about first, second, third prize. It is whoever made a very beautiful kolam gets a winner prize. So sometimes it can be 20 winner prizes. Yeah, that many, and there's not one better than the other because they know that every each kolam is unique. Every each kolam is a unique expression of a unique being, of a unique individual. Yet we're all together in this. So, so beautiful. So then we come to the next um, bigger arrangement of um, kolams. And we are still in Mahalakshmi's energy and we have this beautiful rose. Uh, and you see, I've also painted it in small there. When it's tessellated, when it's tiled, when it's enlarged, when there are six roses around a central rose. And here we call upon generosity, the energy of generosity. A generous heart always forgets the past offenses and is ready to be reassigned ready to re-establish harmony, gives, gives oneself without bargaining. This action, <laughs> this action, you know, it's this action. And we also practice Abhaya and Varada Mudra. And we also practice looking into our heart. So all this in the Kolam practice is very essential because it fuels, that is, it helps. It helps to understand how to make beautiful and consciously choose the Kolam for each event. So if there's a flutist coming, then you look at what does the flute portray? It has an air quality to it. Um, what kind of flute playing is it? So you like that. And then you search in your, in your, vocabulary of kolam, what aligns beautifully to that, yeah, like that. So then we come to the Sikku Nela, Neli Kambi kolams, and there, there is, um, there also, there are thousands of kolams possible. We are still in Lakshmi's energy, and you can see, um, we, we call it gratitude. Um, feeling of gratitude. This is Krishna's anklet. So this component of four loops around a square of earth is 
portraying the anklet of Krishna. And when it manifolds, you have four that manifold. It's tessellating, it's fractal in its energy because it this, what is small, is then reproduced into big and it can grow larger and larger and larger. We also have columns that act like borders that um, hold uh, something sacred and hold a house or a, a temple square or, or uh, even um, an inner courtyard is decorated. Dancers also love to use borders for their dance stage. Um, in all that, there is this very feeling of weaving threads and creating knots and patterns with that and rhythm. So we have all these jatis and all that is back reflected into the kolam where you have a certain rhythm or a certain uh, loop or a jump and it's repeated again and again and there is a certain sequence like that. We find those kind of sequences back in this kind of columns. And there are different types of ways of going around the pulley. Pulley is a dot. So you've got two types of ways like squares and then the circle, the eye or the mandorla or the vesica paisis, then the teardrop, and then we've got the horseshoe uh, or the portal. So there are different ways of going around. And then there are many researchers that have come and gone over the last uh, 60, 70 years. And there has been also somebody in um, Madurai that has developed uh, Sare Gama Padani. This is the vocabulary of Sare Gama Padani. With this, you can make five lakh types of columns, but they're only based on Nerpuli. So you can make columns that stretch out. This whole room can be one big. So there's a, a certain way of putting it together on five by five uh, squares of Nerpuli. And so there, we touch base shortly in the basic training and then in intermediate and advanced, we go deeper into it so that people can empower themselves and use it like a real language to make beautiful columns. And then we've got these beautiful columns. Oh, we read Mahatma generosity, generosity. Gratitude. gratitude, a humble recognition of all that the divine has done and is doing for you. The whole being offers itself to the divine in absolute trust. So it's this offering yourself in absolute trust, one base component. So this also is, you see, we have again this cross at the center and we've got this division and there is this mirroring happening, this mirroring happening. So we've got bilateral mirroring and symmetry, fourfold symmetry, and it's repeated. You know, so how do you repeat? There are so many ways of doing that. So many ways of doing that. So we learn all these different ways slowly, slowly, slowly. It takes a long time to come to more and more advanced components of Kolam practice. Complex. This is a lot more complex, definitely. Really yes. The... But I like to show uh, different levels so that you also feel inspired. It doesn't end here. It, there is. There is, <laughs> like in poetry, you know, you are like in poetry, you make a small poem and then you learn to write a story or you learn to write a whole novel, <laughs> you know, you, you know, like that, it's the same. So here we see the beautiful bilateral symmetry. And I always think of it like two brain halves that I held. And when you practice these columns, you also learn to practice balancing out in yourself, this two halves of the body, that you're balancing and creating harmony and creating harmony. <laughs> and then we come to harmony. Also, Mahalakshmi is quality. This humility. 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 Also, this, we, come, we enter in now into Mahasaraswati, the last three lessons of the Kolam Yoga basic training. And um, yeah, I read it. True humility is humility before the divine that is precise, exact, living sense that one is nothing without the divine and nothing in ourselves. Yes. So 
You've written here breeding, knotting, weaving, sieving, retrieving. Siku neli kambi nir pulikolam, lesson 10. <laughs> I am really going on speed train with you all, and I, I hope it's not too much and you're not like, oh, Grace, what's going on? <laughs> we'll see the video again so that. Uh, yes, also that, and it's a beautiful introduction. And um, if you really feel inspired, all those 12 videos, our lessons are available. And I'm hoping to again be able to also teach it in life. So these were all the Nerapuli, and we're coming now again to Idikapuli. So this is the logo that I chose for our Kolam Yoga practice because I found it so auspicious because in that there's a seed for all these different types of Kolams. And in that you can that you can see that explained in one of the introduction videos that I circulating on YouTube that I made. And here, it's about persevering. The decision to go to the very end. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Knotting, untying, loops, spirals. It's a heart shape at the same time. Yes, yeah? and there are absolutely, there are four hearts actually seated in this column. And they are tied together by this never-ending symbol of the loop, like an eight. And um, so one heart is here. Uh, okay. That's yeah, and this is one heart. And then okay. this is one heart. And this is one heart. Yeah? yeah. And then I've, I've um, created it to sit in a kind of mandala. Mandala is also part of Kolam vocabulary. Yantra is also part of Kolam vocabulary. All this is part of Kolam vocabulary. They're not separate from each other. They are all <laughs> together. <laughs> yes. So with this, um, we find also the earth diamond square, the losange. Yeah. Um, so what does this Kolam actually say when you, when you want to read this Kolam in particular? You look at it and you see that love is deeply connected to the light of the earth. The earth is actually emanating light, light frequency and love. So it's not only the sun that's emanating light, each one of us actually emanates light. People say, I look at her and I see light coming from her eyes. When her eyes become dark, and there's no more light coming from her eyes, she's troubled or she's departing this body. Because of her presence, her soul force, her eyes are lit up. We are all light beings. Our earth is a light being. We have forgotten all this. The Kolam teaches us that it's there, that it's with us. And we, we can rely on it. <laughs> we can deeply, deeply rely on it. Yeah, a lot of mosquitoes here. So we come to the last session. In the last session, I teach you uh, the Saraswati Yantra Kolam to commemorate your learning, to complete your learning. And it's like a big star um, to congratulate you for becoming this beautiful star in Kolam practice. And with these 12 learning sessions, you can actually, uh, for a whole life, be satisfied in creating columns. And I mean creating columns means not copy-pasting columns, but actually creating columns. Really, actually finding ways, so there are many columns there that I have basically created. This one is a... This one is a very ancient traditional one. There are some very ancient ones that are necessary to understand and learn because they teach us the vocabulary. But like, yeah, that's a new one. And the five there is a new one. So I'm now capable of creating columns. I'm now a co-creator of column language. I am capable of speaking in column tongue. <laughs> so, and I wish, I wish to, to give that to everybody, especially Tamil women. I wish to give that to Tamil women 
because I want to give back to the Tamil community. I want to, I want to tell them how I have um, been loved by them. I have been cared by them. They have fostered me. They have nourished me. They have fed me. They have mothered me, and they have taught me the kolam. And I speak better kolam than I speak Tamil. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. And in all that, um, I can keep speaking, but uh, maybe some questions? Yeah, mother is a beautiful woman. Big, big family. And I still remember. And she was working with a lot of young family. Yes, my mother. Yes, I, My mother was my first Kolam teacher. Yes. And because she worked with so many Tamil women, they would come to our house. Our house was also, um, at that time it was new creation, then it became Oro creation, then it became Oro Sajan. And our house in Pondicherry was actually the workshop. So during the day, it was full of Tamil women all sitting embroidery and making drawings on tunni and, you know, and preparing. And then there were some tailors in the back and, and the washing and the, and the ironing. And, and women would come to collect piecework and go. So they would be lining up and sitting in the courtyard and uh, chatting with each other. And sometimes it takes time. So they open up the tiffin box with idlis and mean korumbu and stuff like that. And they would give it to me in my mouth and I would lie down on the lap because I couldn't get attention from my mother. I had so many other mothers. And I tell you, Tamil women, oh my God. So much love I received from Tamil women. I still today, I, I am who I am because of Tamil women. Really not, and my mother is my teacher, my guru, but the Tamil women are my mothers. They are my physical mothers. They cleaned me. They washed me. I learned how to make arsima, you know, with the uh, color. <laughs> I learned so many things. I learned to clean and I learned to wash. And I, all from Tamil women, not from my mother. My mother was the head. <laughs> and the Tamil women were the uh, Vaishyas and the Shudras and, and also like with the Kshatriyas. And, I, and the songs they would sing. Oh, my God, the songs. The beautiful songs, and then we would have theater come and and actors come to the to the compound, and they would all play and dance, and we would have tea time. Tea time was like a celebration. In both of you girls, like you and your sister, there was femininity of Tamil character lived for a long time. Yes, still there. <laughs> but when you are a child, it was so much embedded in you. Yes. You know, the way you behave, you yes. see, talk with us. Yes. Oh, wow. We were and Tamil. <laughs> Ribbons, <laughs> power. <laughs> we were completely... So the shyness. The yes, shyness. very shy. Yeah. It yeah. requires that kind of body movement mm. to become part of that culture. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. to have that kind of customs. Yeah. It's all embedded in that area of the land, which we call it Tamil land. Yes. But you had both the girls you had. Yes. And then I slowly learned to emancipate myself to a globalized <laughs> community. And, and there were, I must say, also shocking experiences, but also um, necessary, because this allows me to be able to do this work now. Yeah. So I'm... Is it this I'm, my memory? Yeah. Yes. There is so many of that. Yes. It still but, carries that memory. What is beautiful yeah. about her is that she studied and she really gone deeper into this uh, very, very column, uh, the symbolic meaning. And you are uh, the way you explain also is fantastic, you know, connecting with the philosophy, the, uh, the tantric and the yantra ideas of souls. Very, very deep, which, yeah. which people know, but they, they, they do it, but they cannot explain. But as yes. you can explain, yes. that was something fantastic. Yes, and I think that's, um, that's why it has chosen, I feel the Kolam chose me to do this work because I have the capacity to go to different communities without um, shaming my family. I don't have to, I can go to a Shaivite home, I can go to a Iyengar, uh, you know, I can Vaishnavite home, I can go, I can go to a village, very poor, and sit down and do a kolam, and I'm not shaming anybody, I'm not hurting anybody, because I'm perpetually the foreigner. <laughs> but 
I still can because of my body movements and because of how I how I've nested in this culture. I grew up with this. I can still merge into them, and you know, and that's how I learned how to see the different layers of the kolam and see the different practices of the kolam. And uh, I also paid a lot of money to learn from Brahmin women how to make kolams. And then in the end, I became their teacher. <laughs> and I was like, oh God, that's not what I came to do. <laughs> so I had to, I had to step back a little bit and become humble again and listen better, you know, to what is actually being told. So, you know, like that. So it's a back and forth. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And my students are teaching me. And um, I'm hoping to get Kamla to come and become a prolific Kolam teacher <laughs> because she did lay her hands on it. She did start. And I even went to her class <laughs> under a banyan tree in, um, in Centerfield. And I feel um, we need more uh, real Tamil women teaching Kolam integrally. Uh, with a lot of uh, love and compassion, so that it can it can be rejuvenated. Oh, yeah. Because when your mind went to create that, what inspired you, and how much time you had to consecrate to create such beautiful? It's it's like um, you have a few ingredients. And you feel these ingredients go in a certain way good together. And then all of a sudden you taste a new ingredient and it matches three of the ingredients that you know. So something new is taking place. And then you start to explore and this exploration because in each one of us humans, we have a desire to explore. We have a desire to grow. It is inert in our blueprint. It is in our makeup. It is in our way of doing. And when we get stuck and we are no longer exploring and we are no longer creating and we are no longer, then we fossilize and we become bitter and our tongue becomes filthy, you know, and we start speaking badly. And, you know, so this, this is a sign that we are stuck. We are no longer in the co-creation. So we need to, and Kolam has helped me so much to keep, flowing to keep being in the co-creation and um, when you enter into the kolam community we also rub off onto each other it's like in dance you rub off onto each other you see another beautiful dancer and you're so your heart you know this is overflowing with joy to see that there's another possibility of something you know and so this is so important that we rub off onto each other and ignite each other and stimulate each other and support each other and help each other grow. And that's, that's also a task for those that have, like I have been given this, now my duty is to pass it on. I, I have not for nothing been given this. I cannot hold all this for myself. That's not all right. That's not why it's been given to me. I have to, it's my obligation. The natural law, it's not a man-made law, it's a natural law for me to pass it on, to give it, to yeah, give it. Continues to yes. Grow. So and that's why I also made the videos so that it has a wider range so that more people can access it. And also permits me, because I also want to make books because a video is one and a half hours and it doesn't encompass everything I want to say. And in pages, I can break down all the images because you, some things you cannot say, some things you have to show because it is a language that you need to see. You cannot only hear it. Your hearing comes from the eyes. <laughs> when doing, you will start to hear the sound of the kolam and start to read it. You can start to, you know, like that. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Is there, um, I mean, where does Shakti come in? The Shakti, the all-pervading Shakti is in that it has, it's, it's held, as you saw, I was weaving also Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, Mahasaraswati into all these um, four big um, 
bodies of shaktis because you need to be able to see the vision, the full vision, the spectrum, and that's Maheshwari's quality. That image, you need to be courageous to take a broom, remove all the obstacles, cleanse the space, give it water to the earth, replenish it, revive it, and then with that vision, lay down the steps, the rhythms of Lakshmi, the harmonious layout, and then with the perseverance of Saraswati, you make your kolam line, you draw it, and she gives you the courage to do it again and again and again until you come to a certain balance of perfection because what goes wrong outside doesn't mean that it's wrong inside. The wrong outside is just a sign that inside it's already starting to rectify. Inside it's already starting to become more balanced. So often when I'm making columns, I have a little bit of a blind spot on my left side. Sometimes I don't entirely see everything. But the larger the column, the bigger the column, the more my left side is like massage, like exercise, like a muscle. And all of a sudden, it opens up. And I can feel it literally opening up the spaces in my brain, in my body. I can feel the flow of energy. And I'm sure if you are doing hatha yoga or you're doing dance or you're doing music, you have those experiences where all of a sudden it starts to flow. You feel whole and you feel bigger than yourself. This is the Shakti force. Yeah, that's such a wonderful explanation because you're dedicating it to Shiva, you're dedicating it to Vishnu, but whoever you're dedicating it to, you are Devi. Yes, it. exactly. In our different yes. forms. That's lovely. Yes, thank you. No matter what you do. Yeah. And in that, it always passes through our body. So our body is the vessel. And we are those four big ones, so it has to, yes, you're most welcome. Thank you for being here, and this is like a support for me. <laughs> yes. You know what? Yeah. You know what? You know what? You know what? You know what? They will come one day, because she knows how to make her Aishwarya Kolam. She knows how to make certain kolam. She made in youth center, she made kolam in the weekend for Tamil New Year. She made in Mylapur kolam. <laughs> and she, 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 when she's finished her um, participation in the, in the now education. Although she is Aishwarya. Yes, she's Aishwarya. <laughs> she will come to this. I know it. I don't have to push her. I live by example. I am the example. She will feel inspired. She feels inspired. There are moments she's inspired. And she and then I have everything there for her to pick up. Like that. <laughs> Thank you.